Welcome, everyone, to New Beginnings, our weekend online service. Um, I'm Pastor Joe Source. I'm the lead pastor here at New Beginnings Church in Brick, New Jersey. I want to speak to us this morning about one of the most well-known verses of Scripture that's in the Gospels. It's found in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. I want you to listen closely. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples and to the multitudes. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So we see here that Jesus has given us a promise of entering into a rest, taking on his rest, connecting with him, joining with him in the effort that the end result would be that we would find rest for our souls, for our mind, our will, our emotions. He's speaking of physical rest. He's speaking of emotional rest and a promise to be with us while we walk through the everyday affairs of life. And we see this theme early on, introduced to us by God himself, this theme of rest or this example that God sets for us of resting. We see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, it tells us that on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Now, let's be honest with each other. God didn't rest because he was physically tired. It's impossible for God to become physically tired. He rested because he wanted to make us aware of the concept of rest for our own sake. We see his reminders about rest, about peace, about calm, all throughout the word of God. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 14, and he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And we see this, wherever his presence is, there's rest. When he comes on the scene, there is rest. Isaiah chapter 26, verse, verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So we see here that when we come to a place of trusting God, when we come to a place where we've allowed him to establish that track record in our life, we find peace when our mind is continually stayed on him, when we're focused upon him when we're not scattered and when we're not obsessed with all these different things that kind of pop up in our everyday life, if we'll stay focused on him, if we'll keep our thoughts on him, we will have perfect peace. Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Now, if you'll go look in Proverbs chapter, 20, uh, chapter 3, verse 24, it says, it, it describes the sleep that comes from God as a sweet sleep, uh, a restful sleep, a rich, deep sleep that brings refreshing Again, we're seeing all the times throughout the Word of God, and there's many, many more. I could not take up the time to go through all of them. We're seeing how many times we're reminded about the importance of rest, of peace, of calm. In Mark chapter 6, verse 31, then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So again, Jesus is stressing the importance of rest. In Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 6, we're told, do not be anxious about anything. In other words, don't be restless about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and guard your mind in Christ Jesus. Again, resisting the temptation to become restless. And we're living in such a time of life right now where there's so much that we could become anxious over, 
there's so much turmoil on, on our political scene, so much upheaval uh, in our culture um, that it's, without being intentional about keeping our mind on God, without being intentional about relying on the promises of God as it pertains to this subject of rest, we can become so restless, we can become so anxious that it will cause us to shipwreck our lives because many times we're, we're in these periods of restlessness and anxiousness where we're lacking that peace. And those times, sometimes we're forced to make decisions under those conditions. And we always find out later on, man, that was the wrong decision to make. Why? We never make decisions under stress. We never should make decisions when we're restless. We should only go for forward when we're sensing the peace of God giving us direction going forward in life. Now, I've read probably four or five scriptures here. We see in Genesis 2 that God set the, the example of rest. In Matthew, the first scripture that we read, Matthew chapter 11, Jesus is urging people, come to me, come to me, connect to me. Let my presence affect you and you'll find rest for your souls. Even though we are constantly reminded of the importance of rest, of peace and of security that comes from God, it continually escapes us. It seems like rest is the hardest thing to obtain. Now understand again, I want to make this point clear, that the rest that God speaks of is much more than physical rest, but rest in our souls. Rest from the stress. Rest from overachieving. Rest from the cycles of bad habits, bad habits and addictions that plague us at times. Listen to Hebrews chapter 4. The writer of Hebrews is drawing from examples in the Old Testament to reinforce that point that I just made. That it seems like this rest that is promised of us from God seems beyond our reach at times. It seems like it escapes us, although we're trying to get a hold of it in our own strength. Hebrews 4, verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. In other words, you should be concerned about this. If you're not experiencing the peace of God, if you're not experiencing rest that can only from God, you should be concerned about this. Some of us have grown so tolerant of the stress that we live under, we don't even recognize it anymore. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Now, we'll find out later who the them is that he's referring to. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said. He's talking about God now. And I'll just tell you right up front. He's referring to the Israelites that came out of Egypt on their way to the promised land. We know that they did not experience the rest of God. We know that they didn't experience the, the, the goodness, the abundance of God that could have been available to them. So God now responds. Now, the writer of Hebrews is quoting from the Old Testament, especially the book of Exodus. So God said, So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. In other words, God's saying, even though I had everything in place for you, you still didn't enter into my rest. You still were disobedient. You still did not cooperate. And we'll find out a little bit more about that. Verse 4, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. Talking about Genesis chapter 2. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. We're going to find out why those Israelites could not enter into the rest of God. Since therefore there remains that some must enter in, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter in, here it is, because of disobedience. So we see now that one of, the, one of the things that will rob us from the rest that is promised us, that peace and the calm and stability that's promised us, is disobedience. Verse 7, again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, now he's referring to the Psalms, today, after such a long time it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So we see another reason why we forfeit the rest that God has promised to us. Disobedience and hardness of heart. Verse 8, now he's talking about 
after the Israelites have crossed into the promised land. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Verse 9, here's what I want us to focus in on. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Verse 11 now. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. In other words, what's he saying? Hey, let's learn from the example of the Israelites. Let's learn from their examples of disobedience and hardness of heart. Let's not fall into that same trap. That rest is still available. Even though they didn't enter into it, we still have the opportunity. We still have, it's available to us today to enter into this place of rest, this place of shalom, this place of, of peace and stability, even in, the midst of, of a ter- even in the midst of a storm, even in the midst of turmoil and upheaval. You and I had that promise from God that there's a rest that's on reserve for each and every one of us. I'm going to find out how we enter that rest. So how did God's people miss out on, on the rest that he promised? And who were these people? You've got to go back to Hebrews chapter 3, the chapter before we're reading. Verse 16 says this, For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? He's telling us right here. He's speaking about the Israelites. He's speaking about those that came out of Egypt, those that walked through the Red Sea that had been parted, those who had seen the miracles of God throughout that time of crossing and transition, coming out of slavery, coming into the promised land. He said, who is it? It was them. Now, with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So, so far we've seen God's people failed to enter into the place of rest, the place of peace, the place of security due to a few few different reasons. Number one, disobedience. Disobedience. God would tell them to go right, they want to go left. God would tell them to stop, they'd want to continue. God would tell them to proceed, they wanted to stay still. Constant disobedience. Number two, not applying their faith. Number three, unbelief. Unbelief is not not knowing. When someone doesn't know about something, that's ignorance. It's a lack of information. Unbelief is when you've had all the evidence possible given to you and you still refuse to believe. Hardness of heart had affected them. They became cynical and bitterness filled their heart. That seems like a lot to overcome. The Holy Spirit is using the, the example of the Israelites that were rescued from slavery in Egypt, bring, brought into the promised land to speak to us today. That, that whole experience of the Exodus, coming out of slavery, coming out from under the kingdom of Pharaoh, a demonic inspired kingdom, is very much symbolic of you and I coming out of the kingdom of darkness, transitioning, coming through that Red Sea, that born-again experience, coming up on the other side and heading into the plan of God for our lives. It is all symbolic. So what, let me ask you this question. What are the things that could possibly stop us from experiencing the rest that Jesus has promised to us? Disobedience, not applying our faith, just like they did not apply their faith, in the Exodus story, it's unbelief, refusing to believe no matter how much evidence is given us, refusing to believe something like that God actually wants us to experience peace, refusing to believe that he loves us enough, that he wants us to to have a life here that is undistracted so that all of our attention, all of our focus, all of our adoration can go towards him, not because he's egotistical, because he knows that's when we function best is when we keep our eyes on him, when we're just undistracted, when we're focused, when we're what Isaiah said, he'll keep us in perfect peace when our mind is stayed on him, not on everything else that's going on around us. Hardness of heart. Yes, we've all suffered disappointments. We've all suffered betrayals. We've all carrying, we're all carrying wounds from the past. But those things can either prompt us to get closer to God, or they could cause us to become cynical, cause us to become bitter, and cause our hearts to harden. 
obviously he's not talking about the physical pump that's in our chest. He's talking about our soul. He's talking about uh, our personality, our character, our nature. Not allowing it to become bitter. Not allowing us to become bitter hearted because this person or that person uh, turned on us and betrayed us. And, and, and maybe you've gone through a situation in a relationship where you've been cheated on. Maybe it's a situation of adultery that you've been affected by. Uh, you, you can't let these things stop you from entering into the rest that God has promised you. Maybe you had a business deal go bad, and so now you have a cynical attitude about ever trying to uh, strike out on your own and getting into your own type of business and, and doing things that, that cause you to, to feel fulfilled and contented. You can't let those things stop you. You cannot let your heart become hard. You've got to enter into the rest of God. Let Him bring these things to pass and resist the temptation to become bitter hearted. Understand when Jesus said, come to me, connect yourself to me, learn from me, then you'll find rest. And listen, okay? If you're not, if you're not aware of some of the things that are being spoken of in that Matthew chapter 11 uh, verse of scripture, where he's talking about take on my yoke. We're kind of blind to that in our Western society here in, in our modern day. Uh, what, what, what would happen in, in ancient times. And even today, I would imagine the same thing happens in agricultural societies. When you want to train a, a young ox, one who's never, uh, never had the opportunity to work uh, the fields and to plow and to carry heavy burdens, what you would do is you would take a, an ox that was more mature, one who was more uh, experience, if we could put it that way. And what you would do is you'd get this device, which is called a yoke, which would be a wooden uh, frame type thing, when it would, one side would have an opening for the, the head of the ox to go through, uh, who is more experienced, and the other side would have an opening for the immature ox to go to, so that that immature ox can learn from the one who's mature. Well, Jesus is putting himself in that same place of the ox. He's saying, come and hook up with me. Come and connect with me. Come and attach yourself to me. Allow me to take you under my wing, and I will give you rest for your souls. What an amazing picture. What an amazing expression of the goodness of God, the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows what it's like to live on this planet. He knows what it's like to live as a human being here on earth. He knows how tough it can be. And what is he saying to us? He doesn't say, hey, you're on your own. Here's my principles. Read my book. Uh, go watch my, my YouTube video. What's he saying? No, come here. Connect with me. I know it's tough. I know you're hurt. I know you're wounded. I know you've been through disappointments. Come and connect with me. Come alongside me. And then when Jesus leaves the scene, it's the Holy Spirit who comes alongside us and says, come on, yoke up with me. Connect with me. Hook up. I'll teach you. I'll show you. I'll walk you through. I know life is tough. I know you've been hurt. But it's the Holy Spirit who not only brings us comfort, but he also teaches us, trains us. Christian author Max Lucado has some really awesome insight to offer along these lines. I want you to listen. When you give your heart to Christ, he returns the favor. Ezekiel 36, 26 tells us, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Isn't that awesome? When we give our heart to Christ, he gives us a new heart. For many, this is him speaking now. For many years, I missed this truth. I believed all the other prop prepositions, Christ for me, Christ with me, ahead of me. And I knew I was working beside Christ, under Christ, and with Christ. But I never imagined that Christ was in me. No other religion or philosophy makes such a claim. No other movement implies the living presence of its founder in its followers. Muhammad does not indwell Muslims. Buddha does not inhabit Buddhists. The Christian is a person in whom Christ is happening. That's so cool. Christ is happening in you if you're a Christian. Christ is happening in me. He's, he's happening. He's teaching me. He's yoked up with me. He's brought me alongside him. Think of this, that, that, that phrase there, Christ is happening. In other words, salvation is more than just going to heaven. It is Jesus continually working in us, with us, through us, doing the work in us. 
It is not us striving, toiling, or slaving day and night, trying to be good, trying to live holy, trying to be more and more like Jesus. It's allowing him to work in us so that he can work through us. True rest comes from allowing the Holy Spirit to do whatever is necessary to change, to transform, and to create Christ in you, the hope of glory. Bottom line is this. Rest is allowing God's grace to flow over us and fill us with his security. In other words, grace will bring us to a place of rest when we have confidence in our Savior. Max Lucado went on to say this, rather than tell us to change, he creates the change. Do we clean up so he can accept us? No, he accepts us and begins cleaning us up. Grace is God as a heart surgeon, cracking open your chest, removing your heart, poisoned as it is with pride and pain, and replacing it with his own. His dream isn't just to get get you into heaven. His dream is to get heaven into you. In Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, God addresses the people who saw the greatest outpouring of God's power up until that time. They saw the 10 plagues come upon Egypt. They saw the Red Sea parting. They experienced manna from heaven, water flowing from a rock, not once, but twice. They saw the Jordan River at flood stage split open in two. They saw Jericho's walls fall down, yet they didn't allow their faith to simply trust God to be loving enough to bring them into the land that he had promised. I hope after what you've seen God do in your life, I remind myself as I'm talking to you to remember the things that God's done in my life so that it brings me to the place of faith that I can trust him, that he is very capable of bringing me the rest of the way. He is perfecting the things inside you and inside me that concern us. In other words, those people in the Old Testament involved in the Exodus experience, they did not take hold of his rest because they did not take hold of his grace. I'm going to say that again. They did not take hold of his rest, but they didn't experience his rest because they didn't experience his grace. They did not take hold of his grace. They rebelled. They wanted to do things their way. They sinned against God constantly and then asked for forgiveness. They lived on his mercy rather than enjoying his grace. Oh, my Lord. We can do that even today in our Christian walk. Even born again, spirit-filled, we can, we can be content to live on his mercy rather than enjoying his grace. Listen to what Max Lucado said about that also. Grace goes beyond mercy. Mercy gave the prodigal son a second chance. Grace threw him a party. Mercy prompted the Samaritan to bandage the wounds of the victim. Grace prompted him to leave his credit card as payment for the victim's care. Mercy forgave the thief on the cross. Grace escorted him into paradise. Mercy pardons us. Grace woos us and weds us. Grace is rest, and rest is the result of experiencing, accepting, taking hold of God's grace. I hope you're listening. The weariest people on earth are Christians trying to earn God's favor, trying to earn God's attention and his promises, rather than just trusting God, staying in faith, and enjoying his grace. Hebrews chapter 4 starts out telling us that there's a rest that's awaiting us. It's waiting us. It's waiting there for us to enjoy. Don't be content to live under God's mercy, just plugging away every day, stumbling and falling into the cycles of sin. And then the sin leads you to the cycle of remorse, repentance, and restoration, only to fall back again into that cycle all over again. Let's tap into the grace of God by giving him our faith And let's enjoy the rest that comes by grace. Mercy begs like a slave. Grace approaches God with assurance. It's so amazing how Hebrews chapter 4 starts out 
about this promise of rest, about this promise of walking into a life on an everyday basis of experiencing the presence of God, having confidence in God, not striving in impatience because maybe God hasn't done something as quick as you wanted to do it, but just enjoying the ride with him. Hebrews 4 starts out talking about that rest that has escaped individuals. It certainly escaped the people in the Old Testament. But he ends up with this awesome promise in chapter 4, verse, starting in verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Oh, on the contrary, our high priest is completely aware of what it's like to have to live on planet Earth. But he, in all points, was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, here he comes. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. Wow. So yeah, for my mess-ups in the past, for all that I've messed up until this point in time right now, there is mercy available to me. Mercy that would replace punishment. Mercy that would cause me to not lose ground in my relationship with my Father in Heaven because I messed up. But while I'm there and I've received this mercy, I want now to take hold of His grace because His grace is going to empower me not to fall back into that very thing which I needed His mercy for. Grace is the rest. Grace, having received mercy, having, having been cleansed from all unrighteousness, now I take hold of God's grace by faith and now I can, I can sigh a sigh of relief, not a sigh of stress, not a sigh of desperation, not a sigh of disappointment, but a sigh of my Father loves me. I can enjoy his presence. His grace is now equipping me, empowering me, teaching me not to fall back in these cycles again. It's only when we're convinced of his love that we can come boldly to the throne of God's grace. Now, maybe we can read Matthew 11 with a fuller understanding. I'm going to read to you from the message translation of the Bible. Are you tired, worn out, burned down on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn. This is cool. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Unforced. It won't, it won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me. Here it is right here. Here's the key. Keep company with me, and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. When I've been to the throne of grace, I come away with that sigh of relief, just as I talked about. That's the rest that God's promised. That's the rest for my soul that I need that will cause me to experience the calm, the peace, the stability, the wholeness that can only come from his presence. I pray that if you've been experiencing weariness lately, if you feel burned out, if you've been just living a life of striving on your own strength, trying to get God's attention, trying to good, do good things for God, trying, 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 trying out of your own strength, I pray that you'll stop trying to build your house in vain and let him build you. Let him bring you to that place of rest. Let cut out the disobedience. Be sure to walk in faith towards him. Be careful not to, be, not to have your heart turn bitter and hard. 
Do not doubt, but believe. Make the choice and the decision that you're going to believe God's love for you. That's the key for it. That's the key to experiencing his rest. You and I are going to mess up. You and I are going to sin. You and I are going to stumble. You and I are going to fall from time to time. God knows that. He knew it, yet he still chose you. Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves me. I pray that you would turn to him even now. If the, are there areas in your life that need mercy? Then go obtain mercy. But while you're there obtaining mercy, receive his grace that's going to bring you rest and it's going to bring you empowerment so that you don't fall into that same trap that the Israelites did. They never entered the promised land because they never entered his rest. I pray that this has impacted your heart. I pray that this is a blessing to you. I pray that you'll share this with someone that you believe is in that same situation. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.